One of the distinguishing features of Sega's early arcade hardware was its ability to scale sprites in real time. Whilst this might not seem so impressive by today's standards, back in the early 80s, most graphics hardware operated with rigid graphics formats. So as a programmer, you'd be forced to use graphics that were a fixed size. Unlike today, the hardware limitations played a more significant role in determining the look and feel of your game. This defined the iconic appearance of many 2D games of the era which had a distinctly grid-like appearance, with square tiles and blocky sprites. One important milestone before video games made the jump to full 3D was the ability to freely scale 2D graphics in real time. This made a much wider variety of games technically possible, especially in genres like racing and shooters, where a chase view camera could be desirable. The competition between developers to have the most technically impressive title was significant. Unlike today, where virtual online stores have unlimited shelf space, an arcade was a physical space and floor space was limited. Making your game visually distinct and stand out was an important commercial factor. If your game didn't draw revenue, it would quickly be removed from the arcade. Sega were one of the first developers to introduce sprite scaling, and in fact, they did so much earlier than you might expect. Back in 1976, they launched Fonz, a discrete logic game that didn't even have a CPU, and the audio was played back off an 8-track tape. It's actually quite hard to find footage of this game online because it isn't emulated. But it wasn't until Sega's VCO hardware launched in 1981 that the seeds of modern sprite scaling started to sprout. Turbo was the first game to make use of this hardware, and it's fascinating to see how the sprite scaling effect was achieved. To scale the sprites, the hardware voltage is actually adjusted, which causes a change in clock speed. Doing this, means that the sprite data is fetched at a different rate. I imagine that a slower data fetch speed results in a slower sampling rate of the sprite data, and a slower fetch speed of the graphics data will cause it to enlarge. You can see the problems with this approach. It appears the developers had difficulty synchronizing the sprite scaling with the road speed. But this was a fairly primitive approach compared to what was to come next. In 1985, the Hang On hardware launched, which marked the start of the Super Scalar era. The hardware was able to display and scale up to 128 sprites simultaneously, as well as allowing for an incredible flexible range of sprite sizes from 8x8 pixels up to 256x256 with no voltage changing hacks necessary. This hardware evolved over the coming years, with iterations being used for Space Harrier, Enduro Racer, Super Hang On, Outrun and Afterburner, amongst others. This line of hardware reached its climax in the late 80s with the all-powerful Y-Board, three independent 68,000 processors and graphics hardware that effectively rendered full 3D game experiences with 2D sprites. Power Drift was probably one of the best known games of this era, almost a forerunner to Mario Kart. Whilst OutRun didn't use the most powerful version of this technology, it is objectively the most successful Superscalar era game, shifting around 30,000 units. OutRun's iteration of this scaling technology enabled sprites to be scaled from 50% to 200% of their original size. That is to say, they can be halved or doubled in size. As such, when you look through Outrun sprite ROMs, you'll see five pre-scaled sizes for each sprite. There was a hardware limitation on the amount a sprite could be scaled. 
So there still needed to be multiple pre-scaled versions of each graphic. It wasn't merely a single image. So how is a sprite scaled? Well, as an example, let's take this Space Invader. Let's say for every pixel in the original image, I sample and draw that pixel twice. Well, then the final image will become twice as big. I've doubled the number of pixels. Conversely, if I skip every other pixel, the final image is half the original size. The process is simple, but the thing is, it's very slow to perform this in software when you're looking to scale hundreds of sprites per frame. Why is it slow? Well, it's simply because of the amount of data we're reading and writing. And remember that the algorithm isn't always as simple as the example I've just provided. We aren't always doubling or halving the size. Often we'll be using a fractional value to sample the source graphic. Outron's code base contains a gigantic lookup table that effectively maps the Z coordinate of a sprite which is to say how far away from the camera it is to one of the five images and it provides the appropriate zoom value for that image. One surprising detail is that this table actually contains a bug in the original arcade version. If you pay close attention, a sprite scale towards the camera, they pop to an incorrect size just for a single frame. This is because of a bug in the original table data. I imagine some of these values were manually transcribed, causing errors to creep in. This is of course fixed in the Amiga version of the game, along with a number of other bugs present in the arcade version. Now, if you delve into the MAME sprite scaling code, which emulates Sega's graphics hardware, you'll notice, number one, it's very concise, two, it's very flexible, Three, it's written for ease of maintainability and clarity. And yes, this is good programming and the way it should be done. Now, I somewhat boasted in a previous video about how much more concise and elegant my Amiga road rendering code was when compared with MAME. <laughs> but when it came to the sprite zooming, I took completely the opposite approach. And rather than making the code more concise, the code absolutely ballooned in size. What MAME elegantly achieves in one short function became a massive 34 separate functions on the Amiga. Why was this necessary? Well, these functions are used incredibly intensely and having a one size fits all solution means that the code is general purpose, but also slower than it could be. Whenever there is an opportunity to create a faster bespoke function for a particular use case, I take it. If we can identify how the sprite will be scaled before it is scaled, we can hot swap in the most optimal algorithm to perform the scaling. I'll give you some examples. An obvious example is when the sprite exceeds the boundary of the visible screen and requires clipping. If you know in advance that every pixel of the zoomed image will fit on screen, you no longer need to perform an out of bounds check. Now in MAME, every single pixel that is drawn has a check to determine whether it's on screen. This adds enormous overhead to rendering. And as such, a rendering algorithm that doesn't perform these checks unless necessary is preferable. Furthermore, clipping is subdivided further based on whether the sprite will overlap the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the screen. You might be wondering why we need to check for the screen edge at all. Well, this is because sprites are a flexible width in OutRun, even when unscaled. The rendering algorithm doesn't know where the end of a sprite is until it encounters the control byte. A second example of why we ended up with 36 functions is that shrinking a sprite is faster than expanding it. 
This is not simply because you're rendering more pixels on screen when you grow a sprite, but also because the underlying algorithm can be optimized to require fewer cycles. By splitting the algorithm into separate grow and shrink versions, each use case can be optimized independently, resulting in a case specific advantage. But there's more. I further separated sprites that are drawn normally and horizontally flipped, not because it was difficult to handle both cases with the same code, but because I could once again reduce a few cycles per pixel drawn. Now, normally such extreme assembly optimization is unnecessary, but the sprite rendering code is absolutely pounded and it needs to reproduce an algorithm performed almost instantly by hardware. I did everything I could in an attempt to make this work as fast as possible. A further optimization is identifying sprites that don't need to be scaled. For example, for the duration of normal gameplay, the Ferrari and passengers can be drawn as is, no scaling required. However, when you crash, the graphics are scaled as the car rolls into the screen or towards you for faster crashes. Therefore, I swap between rendering approaches for these different use cases. Shadows are also scaled, but as they are effectively a mask and either off or on, we can take everything we've learned about the above and double it up again for shadows. The lack of color handling for shadows means we can render them faster and with a simpler algorithm, we are able to free up CPU registers to repurpose elsewhere for this particular use case. The other thing to point out is that all the scaling uses fast integer arithmetic. There are no expensive multiply or divide operations. I don't even use a single bit shift. Also, all of these optimizations stack. The more we pull all of these different use cases into separate functions, the faster each one becomes. The big downside to this slightly mad approach is that you end up with a ginormous amount of code to manage. And even though I used assembly macros to generate some of the variations of the code of these optimized functions, the code does verge on kind of becoming unmanageable after a while. Uh, so, but I am releasing the sprite scaling code. So you're welcome to take a look at the granular details and, you know, maybe you'll find some uh, further optimizations that I missed that we can roll back into the game. Once again, I've released some source code to accompany my wild ramblings. The link is in the description to get the source code running you'll need to install VS Code and the Amiga Assembly plugin. Or you can simply compile it with the excellent Vasm Assembler and view the code in a text editor of your choice. For Windows users, I've included a batch file that will compile and link the code if you aren't compiling through VS Code. Of course, the code can be run in WinUAE or even on your real Amiga. I am planning a final part of this Outrun series, but that's gonna land in the new year. Uh, the reason is that I'm gonna start working on a new Amiga project soon. One question that I was asked a number of times at the recent workbench meet was, how did I get started with Amiga assembly programming? And it may sound obvious, but the best way to get started with any project is to have something you really want to achieve that probably no one else is gonna do for you and be prepared to dedicate a small amount of time every single day to it, even if that's only, you know, 20 minutes to an hour. Sometimes it might feel like you're not making any progress, but you've got to ask yourself, what would you be doing with the time anyway? And if it's just watching TV or playing a game, maybe you could do something creative and, and more productive. And as such, I thought it would be interesting to show the next project from the very start. With the Outrun videos, I've been able to compile the highlights and omit some of the wrong turns that I made along the way. 
which makes it seem maybe that it went more perfectly than it did. Uh, the risk of creating videos as you go along is, you know, they might not be as smooth and they might move a bit slower and I might have to backtrack at times. So what is the next project? Well, all I can say for now is that it's not going to be Outrun related, but I think you're going to really enjoy this one. Every project needs to be a little bit different just to keep me interested. I don't want to completely retread old ground. Uh, but the next project, I definitely think I will be targeting the Amiga 500 or the Amiga 1200. And one reason for that is I actually found it a little bit disheartening doing this project where I was using a chunky to planar routine that I explained in the last video. And the fact that that was just taking up so much of the CPU time and despite all these optimizations and other crazy insane work, you know, I was losing 50% of those CPU cycles to something um, I couldn't completely control. So yeah, I think doing like a, a, a pure A500 or A1200 project is gonna be next. It's gonna be really, really exciting. Um, so thanks very much for watching. Um, as I say, there will be more Outrun videos, but we're gonna take a bit of a side road and go off and do something new next. So let me know what you think and catch you in the next video. Thank you.